Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, the power of unconditional love. We'll tell you about a documentary narrating the story of a group of women whose resilience in the face of atrocity is as heart-wrenching as it is gripping and escaping the blue chip art space. One of the largest ever exhibitions of classical masterpieces is happening in Spain at the moment, but not where you'd expect. We'll bring you both of these stories later on the show, but first. The Man of Steel. We share the vision of Serbian sculptor Viktor Kiss, who has built an unlikely home for artists. We'll show you how the mariachi music of Mexico is alive and thriving on the vibrant streets of Guadalajara. Guadalajara, Mexico. In addition to its great architecture, ancient and contemporary art, cowboys and hundreds of flavors of tequila, it's also the birthplace of mariachi music. You'll hear it everywhere, at weddings, baptisms, funerals and special occasions. But it's also performed on streets across Jalisco state for no reason other than pure pleasure. Mariachi has long been the domain of men, but in Guadalajara these days, it's women who are leading the charge. Me llamo Laura Yvette Gutierrez Gutierrez. My name is Laura Yvette, and I like mariachi music. Music that is how I can show how Mexican I am, and everything that I am. It's a music genre that fills my soul, and I have a lot of fun playing it. The mariachi is a representative of Mexican culture since 1800. The word mariachi was first recorded since that time. Mariachi is very close to Mexican culture. A mariachi is made up of a vuela, a guitar, a guitarón, harp, violins, and trumpets. The number of each instrument depends on the number of members in the mariachi. As a child, it caught my attention how people responded to the musicians and the mariachi singers. That is how I started this journey until now. Mariachi music was losing its popularity, but it has been in recent years that it has taken a boom because male performers have been reinterpreting mariachi music and bringing it to the youth, and the new generations are now picking up more of the mariachi music. Mariachi significa México. ¿no? Mariachi significa 
Pues una de las músicas que más hace... I don't remember at what age I first heard a women's mariachi group, but it was a very pleasant surprise. Not only because the tone of their voices are very different, but because it represents Mexican beauty and Mexican women are very beautiful, especially the women of the mariachi land here in Jalisco. Going to a gallery or a museum can be a confusing and intimidating experience for some. Serbian sculptor Viktor Kiss is one of them. He never felt like his work fit in any of those sanitized white cube spaces or shiny art institutions full of inaccessible works of art isolated from the masses. So he created his own space and as our Adil Halim tells us, he's hoping artists like himself would spread their wings and escape the ivory tower into an unusual setting on the outskirts of Belgrade. The fifth annual Devit Arts Festival, the biggest in the region, recently brought 40,000 art lovers to this industrial park turned art space called Chiglana on the outskirts of Belgrade. A significant change from when arts and culture were on the back burner in Serbia following years of war and the closure of two major state museums. Yes, it was a difficult time. It's still some kind of difficult, but it's uh, more open now. The, the, the artist can, 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 can show himself more and present himself more because uh, people are hungry for the art. Uh. Victor Kiss is putting the finishing touches on his Nikola Tesla sculpture. Ironic, as Kiss himself similarly never felt like he fitted in in traditional art circles, so he created his own space for independent artists like himself. What's old is new again. This abandoned brick factory has been given new life as the center for Belgrade's thriving independent art scene. Just a few kilometers from the city center, Tiglana has become a haven for artists and non-artists alike. Even professionals from other fields with a creative itch can come here to exhibit their work. Here you can find street art, sculptures, installations, and an indoor art gallery. The space is open to visitors until midnight daily and serves as an entry point into the art world for many Serbs. Ordinary people didn't have much uh contact with the art. Uh, even in the galleries, I mean, they were afraid to go in the galleries be, because they didn't know what can they expect there. They didn't know what the art mean because uh, artists themselves put them into, into position, uh, you know, something mysterious, something uh, specific. They put them in that position so hard that ordinary people couldn't reach you. Painter Jovana Visnic immediately fell in love with the space. I mean, it, it attached me on the first few it with, with the energy and with the freedom and with the, with the feeling that you can uh, connect here with the others, with the artists easily. She says Tiglana is an invaluable resource for artists like herself. But this is what, what Belgrade needed for a long time and uh, that's why I think it's so unique for, for us and for, for this area in general. Kiss could have gone anywhere else to ply his trade, but since Serbia has its own advantages, material and transportation costs are lower than elsewhere in Europe, and he has the freedom here to fly under the radar. When your country don't, doesn't, don't care much about art, really don't care, for long years because of war, because of you know, everything that happened here, we have more freedom than any, I have more freedom here than in any other country. For Kiss, Tiglana is his response to the classic art scene, where he can literally open the door for indie artists and future art lovers all at the same time. Adil Halim, TRT World, Belgrade. Still to come on Showcase, Trump Loy Interventions. Freeing masterpieces from museum walls. We take a look at one artist who is taking fine art to the streets. Jodi tore dakshune kill 
Rising silence. We'll talk to award-winning filmmaker Lisa Ghazi about how her documentary is giving a voice to unspoken injustices. If no one heeds your call, walk alone. This is the tagline of Rising Silence, a 75-minute feature documentary by actor and writer Lisa Ghazi. It follows nine Birongana women as they describe the unspeakable horrors inflicted on them during the Bangladeshi Liberation War in 1971. This heartfelt film won the Best Documentary Award at this year's Dhaka International Film Festival. TRT World correspondent Shamim Chowdhury sat down with Ghazi to talk about why she pursued this story, how these strong-willed women dealt with being left to their fate, and why nothing managed to dampen their spirits. But first, here is an excerpt from Rising Silence. Jodi tore dak shune keo Na ashe tabe Akla chalo re Ama ke nikdesh di lo Kapur chupur khule phe uti Dih pishet dik thak ea Dui zon ee mea daba tuli lo Tuli akta gasa se lo taa shate baare di lo Tali ea to dukku Koto kai ni aba I am Lisa Ghazi. I grew up listening to my father telling stories about a forgotten genocide. When I turned 17, my father, who was a freedom fighter, told me that he had witnessed hundreds of raped women and girls standing back to back on a convoy of trucks, like sacrificial animals. This image of Birangana women stayed with me forever. Birangana means brave woman. I wanted to meet them, but I wanted to know them as they are and beyond the term Birangana. I see their faces now. I could have been one of them. This is the story of some of these women. Lisa Ghazi, Rising Silence is a harrowing story and one that so few people know about. Was that the reason why you wanted to pursue this project? In 2010, when I uh, finally, you know, get to meet them, um, I, I don't know why I took, you know, a small uh, camera crew with me um, and, and um, filmed their accounts with their permission, of course, and uh, and I was actually sitting with 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 that footage with me, and then um, the inevitable happened. One of the women we met there died, and that shook me profusely. I realized that uh, I mean, when Birangana a Birangana woman dies, her story dies with her, and that. Uh, you know, realization wanted, uh, you know, made me to do something about it. Can you tell me some of the anecdotes, some of the things that they told you about what happened to them that has stayed with you until today, until this day? There are so many. There are so many. I actually met uh, some 80 plus Birangana women, um, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, I have spoken with them, spent time with them. And there, there, there are so many stories uh, that will never leave me. This woman, this Birangana woman, her name is Rajubala, uh, she died. She said that, you know, because of me, my grandchildren are teased. They are taunted and they, they, they come home crying. And uh, my daughter and her daughter 
were, used to be um, you know, called all sorts of names. You, you are a bastard child, you are this, you are that, your mom was a whore, that kind of thing. And one day she stood up and then she was killed. Tell me a little bit more about exa exactly how you got to know them and the things that you did together. During one shoot that uh, we were shooting uh, three sisters and uh, actually there were four sisters and these four sisters were um, uh, kept imprisoned in a rape camp. And after the war, um, right after the war, the youngest sister, she died um, because of internal hemorrhage. So these three sisters actually buried her, uh, and, uh, but they couldn't, um, they, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't organize a, a ceremony, praying ceremony, which is Milad, I'm sure you, you know about it. So they couldn't arrange because nobody would come and join them praying for their sisters. Um, so when we were filming, them. One of the sisters uh, said that uh, we would like to have a milad for, for Buddhi, for the youngest sister. And we, uh, and we said, absolutely. We arranged it and with their permission, we were filming that. But at the end of the milad, one of the sisters, Malika Appa, she, um, she, she, she felt unbearable. You know, she couldn't take it anymore and she fainted. And you know, and we we ran towards them, we fetched water and that kind of thing. And um, uh, my crew, um, director of photography and then the sec second camera, they stopped the filming straight away. I, they didn't wait for me to say cut because it was very, um, very clear about in our minds that there's no way we can, you know, compromise the dignity of these incredible women. What happened to so many of these women, there's nothing in the Bangladeshi history books about it? Uh, at the time, no, no, when I was growing up. Right after 1975, when, when um, Bangabundhu um, was assassinated with, uh, with his entire family, right after that, um, overnight, these women, I mean, the women, the, the Birangaru women who were uh, living um, in, you know, women's centers, re re rehabilitation centers at the time, were throw, thrown out on streets overnight, and all documents and uh, documents um, were burned down. Uh, so there's very little documents about these women uh, in in our country right now. That's why I felt so desperate to hang on to some of their stories. It's also how the community reacted. Would you not agree? Yeah, absolutely, because, you know, the, um, the stigma, um, uh, stigma and collective shame attached to rape uh, was so appalling that um, it wasn't spoken of in public at all. Some of them who wanted to talk about it, they were shunned, ostracized, and, and uh, ultimately almost forgotten. All their lives, they just, they received, you know, they received hatred. They received uh, all, all sorts, you know, stigma um, towards them. And, and they, they, they did not want to have the same kind of reception from me. Do you think they'd lost the ability to trust again? No. That's the amazing thing. No. They haven't lost the ability to trust. They haven't lost the ability to love. Their, uh, their power of love uh, and compassion uh, is, is honorable. We wanted to touch the person who behind this term, Birangwana. You know, we want to know them on their own terms uh, beyond, uh, beyond any labels or any statistics. Because when you think about 200 to 400,000 women and girls were systematically raped and tortured, do you see any face? I didn't, I couldn't. And that used to bother me, that I want to know the face behind this, these numbers and this uh, title. So to, to touch, to know that person, you have to be, you know, they have to trust you. They have to feel that you are the, their friends. It must still have been an incredibly emotionally difficult experience for you to have interacted with them and heard their stories. How did it affect you emotionally? It affected me hugely. We actually film, uh, filmed in two phases. In one phase we filmed for 37 days. Um, we, we were on the road for 37 days uh, and, and then the second phase we went to uh, Kolkata in India 
to do, do another story for uh, six, six days. And while we were doing that, uh, you know, while, while we were on the road, um, that time, I think that that completely changed me as a, as a person. And I, uh, you know, to be able to spend time with these women, I actually, I actually uh, came to know about myself, you know, better. Um, I, I, I know that what I'm capable of as a woman and what should be my priority. And these things, uh, you know, are for me uh, life lessons. We were filming in, in a kind of a forest kind of uh, uh, setup, you know, and it just uh, it just um, this 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 um, this long trees, and it's just behind one one of the survivors' house, um, and her name is Shujapa. She also died, and uh, we were talking, uh, and then suddenly. She said, I can, I can see them coming. Can you see them coming? I can still see them coming. I cannot tell you what that felt. You know, she was referring to the Pakistani, Pakistani army. army. But you got, so she was having, so a, a, she this, has that recurring, yeah. uh, you know, vision, vision that these of them approaching, of, of them approaching. And then I thought, I'm so sorry, I get really emotional <laughs> sometimes. And then I was thinking that to be a, to to live with this all all your life. I mean, how can you cope? How did they cope? You know, it's a, um, that was my my number one question to them: that how did you cope? You know, they used to seek each other. They used to uh, used to find each other. And I was like, how did you find? How, 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 do, how did you know that that person is also a survivor? And she said, I don't know. Something would give away and we would know. Nearly 50 years on, not a single person has uh, been taken to court over this, prosecuted over this. No, no. If you ask me about the principal perpetrators, which are the Pakistani army, no. But recently, these survivors are receiving some kind of financial assistance from the government now and also some kind of uh, psychological and social support as well. So things have improved in that sense. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? I mean, uh, things have hugely improved. I mean, in 2015, they, they have been given uh, the status of freedom fighters and they, uh, I mean, um, the whole um, process uh, ha, ha, um, started at the time um, in 2015 to give them uh, a monthly stipend. But it, it is, um, it is a long process. Uh, the, uh, they have to be registered first to, to be able to attend those uh, facilities. Uh, so the, uh, it's ongoing and many uh, Binangana women are under this uh, program, but um, not, not, not enough, not enough. Oh, best of luck to you, Lisa Gazi. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. That wraps up another episode of Showcase. Although, you can find more of our stories on our YouTube channel. But before we say goodbye, early on the show, we mentioned a Serbian sculptor who created a space for artists as a kind of protest against institutionalized art culture. And this next story is also about an artist who wants to free paintings from the sacrosanct walls of museums and galleries. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. <laughs>